1990s, TV shows like America's Funniest Videos were among some of my favorites. The videos I liked the best were when people would get kicked in the nads by an animal like a goat or their kids would whack them in the head with a big plastic bat. I spent many an evening in front of the TV doubled over laughing at others' bad luck. I'm aware that not all people find this kind of stuff funny, but I'd wager, judging from the popularity of the Three Stooges, that there's more of us out there than care to admit it. However, since the following happened, I'm a lot less likely to mock others in their times of misfortune. Since I was about ten, the male members of my family, in the early years this consisted of my dad and his brother, took an annual trip to British Columbia to hunt moose. This usually took place around late September or the closest time to that all those involved could get the time off. Since the first year of the hunt, I'd begged to go, but was always told I was too young. This ritual was repeated year after year until I was 14, when it was finally decided that I was mature enough to handle it. Now, I'm going to stop here and address something I'm sure will come up in the comments once the story is posted. I am well aware that there are many reading this that hate hunting. I'm not here to field a bunch of angry comments regarding your feelings about the act of hunting animals. Please send those to PETA. I'm here to tell you a story about something scary that happened in the woods. Well, now that I'm off my soapbox, I'll continue with my story. Being allowed to join the hunt in my family was sort of an unspoken rite of passage, an unofficial stamp that I was now a man, and you better believe that's how I felt. In order to prepare for the hunt, we made our trip to Cabela's to get all the stuff I needed for my kit to move forward. The remainder of the stuff was handled by the outfitter, all the way down to the flight in. At the end of September, everybody packed up for the long flight and... Before I knew it, we were standing next to the small river that was the base camp of every hunt since the beginning, four years before. We enjoyed a massive dinner that evening, and although I was exhausted, I got very little sleep that night, mainly due to excitement. Morning came all too soon, but my adrenaline high kept me going. Before we left out that morning, the outfitter held a brief safety meeting in order to remind all those attending that we were in a dangerous area. Whether it was a grizzly, wolf, or a rutting bull, we had to keep our eyes open because there was a lot of things in these woods that could hurt us. After the meeting, we headed out. I was in a group with my uncle and one of the guides. After a hike of about five miles with a pack on my back, I was starting to drag. The lack of sleep was catching up with me. The guide must have noticed I was tired because he suggested we take a break at a small clearing at the top of the steep hill we had just hiked up. The break came just in time. I threw off my pack and laid down next to the remnants of an old fire pit. The other two put down their packs and began pulling cooking pots in a small stove out, preparing to, what I assume was make some coffee or snacks. About the time everything was set up and the stove began blazing, a loud crashing noise came from the tree line, only a matter of feet away from us. We jumped up in time to see a massive bull moose charging out of the trees. We all scattered, trying to anticipate where the bull was headed. We were unable to get our rifles because they were laying against a tree behind the bull. None of us were stupid enough to make a target out of ourselves by circling behind a raging moose. I found a tree large enough for me to shimmy up. From my limb, I saw the bull take aim for my uncle, who himself was still running in circles looking for a place of safety. Unfortunately for him, the bull was too close and managed to close the distance too quickly. As he came closer to my uncle, he dropped his head and drove his antlers into my uncle's chest and arms which he had raised to protect his face from the strike. The bull struck with such force that my uncle was driven off the edge of the cliff that we had climbed up only minutes before and disappeared. The bull stopped at the edge of the cliff and looked around for another target, huffing the whole time. The guy took the opportunity to go for his gun. He took a big breath, aimed, and fired. The moose dropped where it stood. Once we were sure the moose was dead, we ran over to the edge, dreading what we would see. My uncle lay motionless at the bottom of the gravel-strewn hill. While well, not being a sheer and super tall cliff, it was still high enough to kill a man if he fell off it, and at first, I was sure that was what happened to my uncle. To my relief, I could hear a quiet but audible moan coming from him. We scrambled to the bottom as fast as we could, and when we got there, he was still moaning. The guide, whose name was Roger, swiftly took control and told me what to do to help him. 
He also told my uncle not to move in case he had a neck injury. Thankfully, he had landed on his back, so we didn't have to move him much. Roger went through a checklist of questions to find out the extent of his injuries. It was obvious that my uncle had a broken arm. The bone poking out from the skin of his forearm made me kind of queasy, but I managed to hold myself together. I helped Roger create a makeshift splint for the break, and I did the best I could to keep my uncle conscious. My biggest fear was he would go into shock. Roger pulled out this weird-looking radio thing that I found out later was a satellite phone and called for a helicopter to evacuate my uncle. Luckily, the outfitter we were using required his guides to be certified in first aid. His knowledge provided him with the ability to give the rescue team a very good idea of my uncle's injuries and condition. He saved my uncle's life, and for this, I'll always be thankful, and every year when I see him at the hunting camp, I thank him again. The chopper arrived about 30 minutes later and took my uncle to the hospital. The list of injuries came up to the compound fracture of the ulna, five broken ribs, a collapsed lung, and a compression fracture of the thoracic vertebrae. We spent the next couple of weeks there, and when he was released, we took the first flight home. The next year or so was quite a battle for him. The ribs and the broken arm healed pretty quickly, but the two surgeries from the fractured vertebrae left him laying up for almost another six months, and the after effects from the concussion has left him with some long-term memory issues. As if it couldn't get any worse, he's been forced to live with constant pain to the extent that he has to wear a morphine pump. I would expect any man to give up and spend all this time at home, but he's never let this whole mess ruin his life, and he's still been able to keep a smile on his face. He still attends the hunt every year, although he's left the hunting part to the younger men and he and Roger have become pretty good friends. And by the way, when we got back, we realized we had completely forgotten about the moose. We had written it off as an unfortunate loss, but a week later we received two large parcels from British Columbia. One was 100 plus pounds of moose meat and the other was the mounted head of the bull. He was indeed a fierce looking creature. The note included simply said, Here's a reminder of your trip. Get well soon. Roger. I'm a caddy at a Florida country club. Since I'm still employed by the club, I'm not going to tell you their name because they have gone to extremes to hide what happened there. Considering there was only a few people involved in the incident, I'd surely be discovered as the source and fired on the spot. I hope that as long as I choose not to name the club, they will let my infraction slide. After all, it's in their best interest to do so. At this time in my life, I need this job more than you can imagine, so I'll do my best to hide the location of the attack. In fact, the only reason why I would risk my job at this point is that I feel that there are areas at the club that present a tremendous risk to club members and those working there. If I was to let this story go untold, I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror anymore. I'm aware that by me writing the story down here, I may be punished anyway, but the guilt of knowing is overwhelming, so I hope that by telling the story here I may be relieved of at least a small bit of the guilt I'm feeling. In the many years I worked at the club, I've seen my share of animals attacking members and their guests. My favorites have ranged from vicious geese and swans to coyotes and wild dogs, Although some of these may seem like hair-raising events, when an animal goes up against a human wielding a metal club, they usually decide to cut their losses and flee. The extent of an injury may be something as small as a bruise or small cut. At least that was, until this happened. I'd started this particular day caddying for one of my regulars. This regular was a well-known surgeon in the area, and despite having his abusive days, he always compensated me well for putting up with his behavior. He was also one of the many club members who went to bat for the caddies when the club announced that they were considering getting rid of them. These prominent members made it clear that they would take their money elsewhere and since we were located in Florida, the club was well aware that these members had plenty of options. As we all know, money talks, so the club quickly dropped any more discussion on the subject and we got to keep our jobs. So, in order to show my gratitude, I do my best to give he and all my regulars the finest service I can provide, and telling this story here is just another way I can show them how thankful I am to them. 
Getting back to the point, once the doctor and his buddies finished their game, they retired to the clubhouse bar and I moved on to my next customer. A regular, we'll call him Mr. Smith, had requested I caddied for him. Luckily, I had just finished up with the doc, so I was free. Mr. Smith was another one of those loyal customers I spoke of earlier, and since we had similar ideas when it came to the game of golf, I was often his caddy. We were only around an hour into our game when he mentioned the plastic grocery bag stuck in the bushes surrounding the pond we were approaching. With putter in hand, Mr. Smith walked up to the pond's edge and removed the bag from the bush and put it in his pocket. No sooner than he had turned around, an alligator burst from the pond and grabbed his leg. The gator wasted no time and started shaking his head and banging Mr. Smith on the shore. It took him a moment, but once the alligator started trying to pull him into the water, he started beating it all about the head. When I saw what had happened, I ran as fast as I could to help him. By the time I reached the pond, the alligator was already attempting to pull Mr. Smith under. We had seen enough Animal Planet to know that if he did manage to pull Mr. Smith into the pond, it would go into what they call a death roll and drown him. If that happened, well, we know what the result would have been. Reaching the pond's edge, I joined Mr. Smith and another golfer that had witnessed the attack and beating the gator all over its head as well. This seemed to do very little to deter it, and Mr. Smith continued getting closer to being pulled all the way in. Then the other golfer yelled out to hit it in the eye to try to blind it, and that's exactly what we did. At first, this had no effect, but the hits must have added up, and miraculously, the gator let go of Mr. Smith and slid back under the water. We didn't hesitate to pull him away from the water a good 20 yards, so the monster wouldn't be able to grab him again. Mr. Smith was understandably shaken, but still calm enough to tell me to call 911. We did our best to improvise a bandage to cover the massive gash on his leg and apply pressure to slow the bleeding while we waited for the ambulance. I wasn't able to stop myself from looking back at the pond every few seconds, worrying that the gator would come after us when we had our backs turned. The wound was pretty bad. You could see the leg bone and despite putting on a brave face, you could tell he was in a lot of pain. The ambulance arrived in roughly 10 minutes and once they were sure he was stable enough, they whisked him away to the hospital. The next step would be to get the gator out of the pond. The police must have called Fish and Wildlife because they arrived with some guys to trap it. It took a couple of hours, but eventually they dragged the 10-foot monster out of the pond. Being a native to Florida, I've seen some big gators, but this thing was a monster. The wildlife guys and their trappers hogtied the gator and wrapped a bunch of tape around its mouth. It was thrown in a box and taken away. I'm not sure what became of the SOB, but if it was up to me, it'd be shot and made into a pair of boots for Mr. Smith. Some members came along later and said that they had seen a much smaller alligator splashing around in the pond, but after an additional one-hour search, no other gator was found. The sightings were considered confused identifications, whatever that means. The club did all they could to push this rhetoric and kindly asked all those involved to keep it quiet for the good of the club. Regardless of what the trappers may think, these members that said this are trustworthy people and shouldn't have been written off. I fear we may have a tragedy before they are taken seriously. Smaller gators become big alligators, it's only a matter of time. As for me, I do my best to stay away from any body of water on that course. Better safe than sorry, I'd say. That night, I visited Mr. Smith after work. They were going to keep him for a day or two, I guess. The wound in his leg needed 45 stitches, he said, but other than that, he said he'd gotten off lucky. This was the king of understatements as far as I'm concerned. That beast came so close to getting him, and I was realizing that the whole mess had shaken me up. I could only imagine he was going to have PTSD for a while. I still have an alligator dream at least once a week, even all this time after. Mr. Smith was back on the course in less than a month and I was his caddy as always. He tried to thank me for helping him but I was quick to remind him that it was the other golfer that came up with the idea of attacking the eyes. I guess he had forgotten about the other golfer being there but I can't really blame him. He had his hands full. Despite talk of lawsuits being passed around by a few members, Mr. Smith was just happy to be back on the course and on his feet.
He had expressed a fear in those moments as we sat there attempting to slow the blood flow from his leg that he may never be able to play golf again. So I imagine money is the last thing on his mind. We pretend on those days that I joined him on the course that life is slowly going back to normal. However, every time I pass that pond, I can't help but be reminded of the danger that slowly grows, day after day, in that dark body of water and dread the moment that it finally lashes out and attempts to claim another of the unsuspecting and ill-prepared. I'm a 35-year-old male from suburban Texas. Most of my younger life, from 8 to about 16, was spent playing and exploring in the large wooded area adjacent to our subdivision. When you spend that much time in the woods, you're going to come across more than your share of snakes. Most of them will be harmless rat snakes, but on occasion, you'll bump into a copperhead or the more common timber rattlesnake. You come across the water moccasin, or as we call them in the south, the cottonmouth sometimes too, but they're usually around bodies of water and often get confused with the non-venomous diamondback water snake. The highly dangerous coral snake doesn't live in my part of the state, so we'll leave him out. Anyway, I'll spare you the herpetology lecture and get to my point. Having become relatively experienced at avoiding poisonous snakes, I never had the misfortune of being bit or even struck at by one. Now, the non-venomous breeds, such as your common grass snake or the variety sold in the pet trade, they have shed a considerable amount of my blood. I've had several pythons and boas as pets and loved them, but I was never able to grow out of my fear of the venomous breeds. I guess now that I've gotten older and have become more citified, the guard I had put up as a kid had went down and I would soon learn how important having that guard up had become. Since I was around 20, I've lived all around the state. Austin, Dallas, and several smaller cities, but after a career-ending injury, I decided to move back home so I could be close to my family. When I say family, I mean my parents. Being an only child, I spent nearly all my time growing up with them. The occasional visits to the grandparents fit in there, but once they passed, it became just us three. When I decided to move back, I stayed with my parents for a brief time before I was able to find my own place. Once I did, I still made it a rule to join them for Sunday afternoon supper. I'm not sure what the nomenclature is in your family, but our Sunday suppers usually started around noon, and with or without my attendance, it occurred about the same time every week and it was special. I used it as an excuse to catch up and before I had a washer and dryer, a chance to do my laundry. Regardless of the reason, my folks were always happy to see me. It had been almost five years since I'd moved back at that point when this happened. I would load up my dog into my car and we would take the short five minute drive to my parents' house. After we had our fill of food, the dog included, I'd use the opportunity to take him for a walk around the old neighborhood. I had noticed on a few Sunday walks that there were an unusual amount of run over timber rattlers in the street. The venomous snakes had always stuck to the woods and never came into the development. Going from never seeing one in 20 years of living there to seeing a handful in a matter of a few weeks was surprising to say the least. On this particular Sunday I discovered that one of our neighbors whose house backed up against the woods had clear cut an area about the size of a football field and created a makeshift neighborhood park. I believe he had mainly done this to have a place to knock around golf balls but it was also a nice place to play catch or have a picnic. You know, regular park type stuff. That day, I decided to take my dog for a jaunt around the park and check it out. It was a nice day, so we took our time exploring this new place. I even came across the dry creek bed where we used to have BB gun wars. The idea of seeing a rattler wasn't even on my mind, as it should have been considering I was walking around a semi-wooded area on a warm spring day. As I came to the far corner of the park, I caught a quick glance of a coiled snake and heard an almost inaudible rattling. The rattler was coiled in the angle to myself and my dog. Luckily, he didn't see it because he would have certainly attacked it and been bit. To keep him from being bit, I jerked his lead with all my strength and slung him out of the way. I thought I had stopped in time to avoid the snake, but I was sorely mistaken. As he struck, I leapt back, still hoping to get out of his reach. I threw my hand behind me to break my fall, 
As I fell, I felt what I could only describe as a poke. When I hit the ground, I began scooting backwards on my butt, attempting to avoid a second strike. But when I looked ahead, all I saw was the black tail end of the rattler slithering away into the trees, and that tail was the biggest I've ever seen. The first thing in my mind was to try not to panic. This is going to be hard considering being bit by a venomous snake was one of my biggest fears. I looked down at my leg to where I felt the strike and the only mark I saw was a single puncture. Considering rattlesnakes and all other venomous snakes had two fangs, I was surprised to only see one mark. Despite this, it did little to calm my fears. I knew it was more than capable to kill me with the one fang. My number one goal was to get to the emergency room, so I hobbled quickly back to my parents' place with my dog, who was giving me a confused look as to why I slung him through the air, walking behind me. I checked him before we left the park, but thankfully he had not been struck. Their house was only about 200 yards from the park, so we got there fast. As soon as I walked in, I told my parents what had happened in a quick matter, and we hopped in my dad's truck and headed to the ER. We pulled up to the ambulance bay and I jumped out and limped through the emergency room doors. By this time, the bite was beginning to tingle and the pain was getting worse by the minute. I made it clear to the admitting nurse that I had been bitten and they wasted no time taking me into the back. Once I had told them the type of snake that had bitten me, they started the anti-venom in my IV. They made the decision to fly me to Dallas to receive further treatment because they were more qualified to treat it. The pain at this point was agonizing, and I fought the constant urge to vomit. Once the pain meds had a chance to kick in, the pain abated to a certain amount, but the nausea was made worse because of my body's reaction to the drugs. At some point, I was able to get some rest and only remember parts of the helicopter flight. The hospital in Dallas put me in ICU so they could closely monitor my reaction to the crowfab. Their theory was that the rattler had only caught me with one fang because I was falling away from it during the strike, and as a result the dirty bugger had not been able to completely envenomate me. In other words, I had gotten amazingly lucky. In the end, I ended up getting five doses of antivenin and fortunately avoiding having any necrotic damage. I was allowed to go home after about the fourth day at the hospital. It had been an expensive lesson and I'm still making payments on the hundred thousand plus dollar bill today. My first investment the following spring was a pair of snake boots and they still get worn on a regular basis during the warmer months regardless of the heat. After all, I'm not going to let some angry snake ruin my love for the outdoors. Since then, I have yet to come across another rattlesnake but if I never see one again, it'll be too soon. That's pretty much the meat and potatoes of the story, and I'll spare you the boring parts. However, before I go, I'll leave you with a little warning. I was recently watching a news report from somewhere up north talking about the timber rattlesnakes being a protected species due to its dwindling numbers. I could only shake my head. They may be rare up north, but there's plenty here, and regardless of their numbers, they're just as dangerous. No matter where you live, keep your eyes open and be careful. It only takes one bite to change your life forever. My name's Rob. I'm 37 and an avid hiker. The following incident happened 10 years ago. My love for nature had been with me since childhood. It's become so strong I took a job working summers at Yosemite while I attended college. I did consider applying for a permanent job after school, but that was not to be. My life pushed me in an entirely different direction, but I'm still happy where I ended up. My decision to go into education gave me the opportunity to expand the minds of the young, but still have a large amount of time off to explore and enjoy the outdoors. The best of both worlds, as they say. The week in which this story unfolded was just like any other summer week. I had taken a five mile hike the prior month and my family and I had a week long camping trip scheduled for the last week before the start of the fall semester. The early part of the week had been taken up by the usual errands and small tasks to do around the house, but I knew that by Thursday the remaining two days would be free to enjoy in any way I choose. Then Thursday morning came around. I made the kids breakfast and once they finished, they scattered around the neighborhood to hang out with their friends. 
Being at the age that they could take care of themselves, 14 and 16 respectively, I was now free to do what I wanted and what I wanted to do all week was take our dog, Lady, and go for a hike in the hills outside town. My wife worked until at least five every day, so I called her to let her know what my plans were for the day. The call went to her voicemail, which wasn't an odd thing considering she was a psychologist and more than likely was with a patient when I called. Anytime I went on my long walks or hikes, whatever you choose to call it, I made sure to leave her as much information about where I was going and when I planned to be back so she would know when to expect me home or when to send help if I didn't return when I was expected to. This is something everyone should do when they go into the outdoors. It's a smart thing to do. Anyway, with that taken care of, I grabbed my small pack and lady's leash and we loaded up and headed out of town. We arrived at the park just before 10am and as far as I could tell, we were the only people in the area. I hooked lady up and let her out of the car, threw on my pack and we headed down the trail. Once I was out of sight of the road, I stopped to take my 38 out of my pack and placed it into my holster tucked into my waistband. I do have a CCW permit. I started carrying a pistol a few years before this happened when I came across a drug deal behind a grocery store and had one pulled on me. I was led to believe I was about to die. I'm not sure if the guy was serious, but if I'm ever in a spot like that again, I'd like to be able to at least even the odds. But that's a story for another time. Lady and I had been hiking for about 10 minutes when we came to a blind corner. We were walking uphill and were unable to see what sat at the top of the hill. I'd been out here before, but it had been several years and I couldn't remember which way the trail led. The only reason that this mattered at all was Lady's behavior as we neared the top of the hill. She had stopped and raised her head and began intensely sniffing the air. Since she had never done this before, I was unsure of what she was smelling. But within a minute, she lowered her head and started walking as usual. It was a head scratcher, but I wrote it off as a regular dog funniness. At the top of the hill, I noticed that the trail split off into two directions, to the right and straight ahead. So I stopped to ponder in which direction we would go. I took the opportunity to take a drink from my bottle and poured some into my hand for Lady. She had three handfuls and I put the bottle back in my pack. The plan was to go straight ahead to decrease the chance of getting lost. Like I said, it had been a while since I had last been out here, so I was erring on the side of safety. In the future, we could take the right fork and explore. We had plenty of time left. If we didn't make it this year, we could check it out some other time. Well, once we had slaked our thirst, Lady and I continued on ahead. We had only managed a few steps before an uproar occurred behind me. Looking back, I saw Lady in full battle mode with a medium-sized dog. I began striking at the other dog with my walking stick trying not to hit Lady. It was obvious she was fighting for her life. Being a Cocker Spaniel, she didn't stand much of a chance against this larger dog, but I was darn sure that I wasn't going to let this mutt kill her. I kept swinging at the dog until one of the swings made a solid hit. It recoiled back for a second and at first I thought it was going to run off. This is when I got my first clear look at it and realized that it was in fact a coyote. Unfortunately, rather than running away, it began approaching us again, but this time in a much more measured way. I could tell it was making the judgment as to whether it should renew the attack. I had had enough of this crap and I wasn't going to give it a chance, so I drew my pistol and shot it. It let out a short yelp and turned to run, but dropped dead before it could take another step. My first priority was to check on Lady. She was very bloody, but the only wounds that I could see were two deep puncture holes on the back of her neck and a deep tear to her back leg. We were both really shook up and I held her while I sat there and stared at the dead coyote. It took a few minutes to get myself together, but once I did, I picked up Lady and ran to my car where I had left my phone. The police and animal control arrived in about ten minutes police had been notified by the dispatcher that I was a CCW permit holder and I left my pistol in my front seat so that they could examine it or whatever they do under these circumstances. But once they were able to confirm that the coyote had only one wound and I had just the one round in my gun, that was as far as they took things. While I waited for the cops, I raided my first aid kit for bandages to treat ladies' wounds at least in the best way that I could until I could get her to the vet. I quickly led them to the body of the coyote and they released me so I could take her to the emergency vet clinic. 
Luckily, the clinic found no other wounds on her. Once she was cleaned up, all it took was 20 staples and some bandages. However, they followed this good news up with the bad news that she would have to be kept in quarantine for 10 days to observe her for signs of rabies. I wasn't overly concerned about the rabies since she had received her shot just two months prior. The worst part would be having to explain to the family that she would be away for all that time. She was a very important part of the family, and she'd doubtlessly be upset herself. She'd never spent a single day without us. During Lady's ten days away, the investigation took place. The police were satisfied with my description of the attack and closed their part of the case. Apparently it came out in the media soon after that a coyote had been seen chasing and stalking multiple joggers, and one report stated that a local resident's dog had been ripped through their chain-link fence and killed by a coyote. The animal control department notified me that the coyote did not have rabies, and after the 10-day period, Lady got to come home. She certainly seemed happy to see us, and I can guarantee that we were all overjoyed to see her. After a few follow-ups, she was given a clean bill of health and was completely healed up in three months. There is one lingering effect from the attack, however. When I take her on walks, she spends a lot of time looking behind her to make sure no other animal can sneak up on her. The fact is, if I'm being honest, I'm a little jumpy on walks myself, so I can't really blame her. When all said and done, I'm glad we both made it through the whole thing, and I imagine my family feels the same way. Since I've enjoyed all the great stories others have written here, I thought it would be only fair that I share a few of my own. We'll start with one story today, and if it goes over well, I'll post a few more in the coming weeks. This first one serves as a lesson to all those out there that believe the big, tough-looking dogs like pit bulls and rottweilers are the only dogs to attack people. Now, I'll be the first to admit that these breeds are responsible for their share of attacks and do more damage to their victims However, in my life experience, I've witnessed far more aggression coming from those breeds of dogs we like to call lap dogs. This first story occurred when I was around 11 or 12 years old. My school would have these yearly candy sales to raise money for a class-wide thing called a field trip. A field trip, for those living under a rock, is a trip in which a group of students would load up on a bus and visit a local landmark such as a museum or something of the sort. In my school district, the usual way in which to raise money to pay for each student's cost was to sell candy. The majority of the sales came from selling door-to-door. -door. The remainder would be bought up by the student's parents at the last minute to ensure him or her would have enough to pay their way. The lucky few of us that reached a certain level of sales would also get to pick a prize of their choice determined by the amount they generated. Of course, I was never one of those kids. I didn't have parents that worked in an office who could get everyone in their building to buy candy. Anyway, that's in the past. The point of the whole candy paragraph was to explain why my friend and I were walking around the neighborhood knocking on doors. I'm not sure how much we had made that day. Probably not much, but I know it was right after school, so we hadn't been out very long. At the time, the middle schools started later, therefore they weren't let out until 3.45. Now, I'm going to be honest with you here and let you know that some aspects of this story aren't as clear to me as they once were. However, that being said, I can see the attack in my mind just like it happened yesterday. So my friend and I had just been basically told to take a long walk off a short pier by one of our friendly neighbors, and were walking to the next house. That's when I saw Kelly. She was a couple years older than me and had been the apple of my eye for as long as I can remember, and she just happened to be my neighbor across the street. We spent many a long summer day playing games like Simon and drawing crappy pictures on her Etch-a-Sketch. She and her brother were even the first kids in my neighborhood to get an Atari 2600. She certainly didn't feel the same way about me, but she was at least still cool enough to be friends with fat, bushy-haired me. When I look back, she was perhaps the only friend of mine I never had a falling out with, and when you're a whiny little fat kid, that's a hard thing to achieve. Meanwhile, back to the door-to-door -door selling as I watched Kelly glide up to the sidewalk. A loud and high-pitched bark yelp blasted from the tall cedar tree located at the corner of the house. I'll do my best to describe the layout of the area. 
The house we had just left had a short sidewalk connected to the two-car driveway. There were no cars in the drive at the time, so we were cutting across it and into the neighbor's yard, headed to their front door. At each corner of the house we had just left, there was a tall and dense eastern red cedar tree that blocked most of the space between that house and the one next to it. This was where the shrill bark had come from. Kelly had just gotten off the school bus and was walking uphill and on the sidewalk heading toward her house located two houses down and around the corner. When the bark blasted out behind us, we turned to look for the source. In the blink of an eye, a small mangy looking little dog tore out from the cedar tree and headed straight toward Kelly. The little mutt moved so fast we barely had time to register what was about to happen. Before Kelly knew what hit her, the dog slammed mouth wide open into her beautiful slender leg. We turned to help her get it off of her, but as soon as it hit, it was gone. When we reached her, it was obvious that she had been bitten. A roughly orange-sized piece of skin had been ripped from her calf. She was understandably upset and in a large amount of pain. Blood had already soaked her bright white keds. I told my friend to beat on the door and tell people at the house that their dog had just attacked someone and meanwhile I ran to Kelly's house to tell her parents what had happened. Her dad followed me around the corner in his car. By the time we had gotten back to the scene, the homeowners were outside, apparently apologizing to Kelly. They kept insisting to her father that she must have done something to antagonize the dog, but my friend and I made it real clear that we had seen the whole thing and that was positively not the case. She hadn't even seen the dog until it attacked her. None of us had, in fact. Kelly's dad was in no mood to argue. He swooped her up into his car and took her to the emergency room. Kelly's mom, who had stayed back at the house, had called the police and animal control people. We spent around an hour talking to the police officers and animal control guy before they said we could go home. From what I remember, Kelly's parents didn't file charges against the homeowners because they paid her medical bills. However, they didn't get so lucky with animal control. The dog was taken and unfortunately put down because it was not up to date on its vaccines. Therefore, they had to test for possible rabies infection and the only way to do that is to euthanize the animal. I suspect it also didn't help that it had attacked someone so viciously. As you may have guessed, Kelly had to undergo a painful regimen of four anti-rabies shots over the next 14 days. Her bite eventually healed and fortunately she was rabies free so that means the dog was clean also. They never determined what caused the dog to attack that day. From my experience working at pet stores and vet offices, I came across a large cross-section of dog breeds and the opinion I have formed is that any type of dog can be vicious towards people. Aggressiveness towards other dogs is a different thing in my opinion. But the dogs that have bit me the most or tried to are the little breeds. I don't believe it's an inherent thing, it just comes from being coddled and treated like a baby. If you don't agree, next time you see a chihuahua, try to pet it or touch its owner while they're holding it. Kelly completely healed and went on with her life just as I did. Her family moved away once she graduated and went off to college. I haven't seen any of them since then. My friend with me that day moved away soon after the dog attack and last I heard about him he was in prison somewhere. If you're wondering, I didn't sell much candy that year and as a result didn't make the class trip but I don't remember caring too much about it. The next year, when we had a fundraiser for a band trip and we had to sell those stale candy bars again, I made sure not to go to that house. I didn't think that they would want to buy candy from one of the kids that got their dog killed. Even all these years later, I keep my guard up when I'm around little dogs, despite my unending love for them. This particular mishap occurred when I was 13. Despite being almost 25 now, I'm still dealing with the lingering effects of the whole mess. In some ways, you could say it was my fault, considering I knew the dangers. But when you're dealing with a large bird, you often get lulled into a false sense of security by their loving actions and beauty. A combination of the two, in addition to just being young, is probably the real reason. Before I get into the specifics of the story... I'll give you the brief backstory of my life and how it was I ended up in that predicament. Without disclosing certain specific aspects of me and my family's business, 
I'll say I ended up living with my grandparents after a rather public incident involving my mother and her employer. Since she had been in trouble with the law before, her punishment this time was somewhat more extreme than it had been in the past. When I was woken up that morning at the age of 10 and told that my mother was going away for a while, I was upset but because of my already close relationship with my grandparents, I got over it after a while. In case you're wondering, I grew up without a dad. Never met the guy and that's all I really want to say about that. My place in the household was not dissimilar to that of any other grandchild. After a couple of months of spoiling me rotten, life slowly eased into a more normal day-to-day -day living environment. My belief is that in order to make me more comfortable in their home, they attempted to give me all the awesome things a kid gets from his or her parents, but I had never received because of my mother's repeated joblessness and jail stints. This scheme did manage to create a spoiled little brat, but my grandfather quickly put me in my place. I'd never really had a strong and positive male presence in my home with my mother, so his reasonable and decisive manner was something I desperately needed in order to become the well-rounded woman I've become. Bless you, Grandpa. I love you and miss you. I can't tell this story without including my grandmother, Brenda. Grammy Brenda had always been a little different. She served in the Navy, then after she left, ran off to live in Thailand. She didn't know anyone there, but fell in love with the country while she was still in the Navy. Most of her years there, she slept on the beach because she had no money. After returning from Thailand, she trained to be and become a pro roller derby girl and even ended up on television. When she met my grandpa, David, and they got married, most of her time was spent at home, working out of their garage as a gunsmith. Like I said, she is not your average woman. By the time I was born, she was breeding and keeping various breeds of birds for the pet trade. When I moved in with them in 2003, she was keeping cockatiels, but was also wanting to get back into the larger breeds like macaws and African greys. I'd become excited by her stories of the big parrots she'd had before and was bubbling over with anticipation to see what she would bring home. In early 2006, she sold off all her remaining smaller birds and came home with a citron-crested cockatoo. I fell head over heels for it. I say it because the bird was only a couple of years old and lacked any of the gender differences that appear in older birds. Of course, we could have had DNA tests done, but the bird's sex wasn't that important to us then. So just to be safe, we named it Don. It was a name that could apply to either gender and plus when it flipped up its crest, the yellow looked similar to a rising sun or at least it did to my 13 year old mind. None of this really mattered in the end. The bird loved my grandfather, so we just started referring to it as her and it stuck from then on. Grammy Brenda sat me down the first night and did her best to teach me all I should know about taking care of a large bird. The most important thing was to be calm and kind to the bird. She was well aware that kids have a tendency to get loud and boisterous. It was important when dealing with cockatoos especially because they tend to be shy and reserved birds. I was also to remember to avoid showing fear to the bird because some parrots will sense this and bite you out of spite. I'd seen this firsthand at a pet store when a little boy timidly petted this black parrot and the bird started biting him. As the boy cried out in pain, the parrot bit harder and harder until a member of the store staff that the parrot must have liked got it to let go of the boy's finger. The poor kid's finger looked like he had been slammed in a drawer, so I made sure to take this particular tip to heart. Grammy let me feed and give fresh water to Dawn every morning. She continued to teach me new things every day. The skills I would learn ranged from the types of fruits I could give hand-raised birds to supplement their diets to the way to trim their wings so they wouldn't fly away. Grandpa would take her from her cage and set her on the big perch that was made for her in the corner of the dining room. She was happy to sit on the perch as long as she could see Grandpa, but, but once he entered a room in which she was unable to see him, she'd throw a fit, screeching and flipping up her crest. Once he re-entered her field of vision, she'd calm down. After lunch, he'd take her from the perch and set her on his shoulder. He'd sit in his chair and watch TV while she walked from shoulder to shoulder across the back of his chair. One afternoon, Grammy asked me to bring Dawn to her so we could check her beak and nails to see if they needed to be trimmed. I walked over to the chair where she and Grandpa sat watching Matlock. 
She was on his right shoulder grooming herself and I put my hand on her stomach and directly in front of her legs to get her to step on my finger just like Grammy had taught me. This had worked hundreds of times before with other birds, but she wasn't having it. She walked to the other shoulder to get away from me, but I just went to the other side and tried again. Like I expected, she refused my hand and walked back to my grandpa's right shoulder. I wasn't about to be beaten at a battle of wills by a bird, so I offered my hand one more time. It finally looked like she had given in when she bent over and bit down on my finger like birds often do to balance themselves as they step onto your index finger. However, something was different this time. When she grabbed my finger with her beak, she closed down on my finger like she was cracking a nut. The pain hit me instantly and I had to stop myself from slapping her. When she heard me yell, she let go and ran back to my grandfather's left shoulder to hide like a child that knew it was in deep trouble. There was no doubt that she had broken my finger. The crunch was so loud Grandpa could hear it clearly. Grandpa and I traded shocked looks and I continued to do all I could not to scream. The pain was the worst I'd ever felt. When I tried to bend the knuckle, all I could manage was breaking out into tears. By now, Grammy had come into the living room because of my yells and loud crying. She could tell what had happened as soon as I held up my finger. It had already turned blue and black at the joints and the pressure marks from Don's beak had turned into bruises. Grandpa, being the cool and calm guy he'd always been, offered his hand to Don and she stepped onto it. He walked her to her cage and put her in. When she closed the door, she threw a fit and started screeching. We all turned our backs to the cage and drove to the emergency room. The x-rays confirmed what we already knew. The finger had broken between the second and third joints, so didn't require surgery or pins. The doctor shot my finger full of painkiller stuff and realigned the break. Once that was complete, the splint was added to hold the finger straight while the bone healed. After a script for some painkillers and a suggestion to schedule a follow-up with the doctor, we headed home. Now, I'm not going to lie and say I wasn't afraid of Don now, but I was determined I wasn't going to let her know it. It was a fault after all. She had made it obvious that she did not want me to pick her up, but I pushed her until she acted out. We created a few new rules after this when it came to handling Don. First off, no one was to touch Don when she was with Grandpa except Grandpa. The next was the scary one. Tomorrow would be just like any other day, meaning I would feed and water Don like nothing happened. It was important not to let her know that I was afraid of her even though I was. Next morning went off without a hitch. She acted as if though nothing had happened and we played along. The break healed up in about six weeks and other than hurting like a mother in cold weather, it returned to normal. Of course, this was not the last time Don would bite someone, although never as bad as mine. Grammy Brenda caught the occasional love bite here and there, but she had become used to that kind of stuff long ago. My aunt also had one of her shiny dangler earrings ripped out of her ear one night when Don was on her shoulder and decided she wanted the shiny toy dangling in front of her, but other than a torn earlobe and a little blood, it didn't add up to much and she was able to laugh about it today. As far as the rest of it all, I continued to help Grammy Brenda with her birds, which eventually added up to an African Grey, a couple of Conyours, and of course Don. That continued until I turned 16 and went to work at the same pet store I saw that kid's finger get mashed in. I stayed there until I went off to college. I am now currently working for a veterinarian part-time while I pursue my doctorate. Unfortunately, Grandpa David passed away in 2015 from a sudden heart attack and Grammy Brenda was pretty down but is doing her best carrying on without him. Don lost her best friend too and for a while things were looking kind of bleak for her. However, one night during a visit to Grammy's house, she saw me and started throwing a fit until I picked her up. I'm not sure why, but I was overwhelmed with the urge to sit in Grandpa's chair, so I did. Since that night, Don's lived with me, and although we are far from friends at this point, we have been brought closer together by a mutual love for the great man we had lost. My name's Cody, and I've been a paramedic about five years at the point this story takes place. I originally joined the department to be a fireman, but after about a year, I'd realized that being a paramedic full-time was more enjoyable to me, and 
After a discussion with my captain and a buttload of training, he agreed I could stay a paramedic as long as there was no manpower shortages elsewhere. Since then, I've spent every working day on a bus, doing the best job in the world, at least in my opinion. However, you're not reading this to hear my life story. Instead, you're here to read about one of the most horrific things I've ever seen on my job. The night it happened had been just like any others. There are occasional shifts where everything seems to go haywire, but those are rare and we hadn't experienced one in quite some time. My normal shift was days, but I had been switched to nights after one of the old timers had retired. Fortunately, I was riding with one of the only two guys I could stand. The rest of our crew was filled with jacked up jocks and drama queens. That night I was working with Donald, possibly the funniest guy in the department and my favorite guy to work with. Our first call of the night was a GSW in a rougher part of town, gunshot wound. We arrived before the PD and since our protocol was to never enter an active shooting situation, we were forced to sit and wait for them to arrive and clear the scene. After a very long 15 minutes, we were finally allowed to enter the apartment where the shooting had taken place, and just as we feared, the victim was already dead. And yes, I am aware I started the paragraph saying this night was like any other. Unfortunately, things such as this are all too common in my city. Despite the rough start to the night, the calls that took place in the following few hours went far better. We managed to stabilize this poor little boy that was having an asthma attack. These things are often made worse by stressful situations, and the boy's mother was doing the poor kid no favors. Once we were able to get him alone in the bus, he responded much better to treatment. By the time we arrived at the ER, the attack was all but over. The call was probably the highlight of my shift. Patients like that are the main reason I love my job so much. Helping others at times when they need it most gives me a supreme sense of achievement. There aren't many jobs that can do that for you anymore. The remainder of the calls that night went smoothly, mainly trip and falls and minor fender benders, all of them except the last. Stuff was winding down and we only had about an hour left. I was riding shotgun and going through the run sheets and double checking them. We had just dropped off a drunk college girl that had been hit by a car full of more drunk college girls. None of the injuries were a big deal. After checking out all those involved in the incident, the driver and her passengers checked out fine and the girl that was hit was left with what appeared to be just a sprained ankle. Of course, the girl driving got to spend the night in the jail. On the way out of the hospital parking lot, we received a call to meet the police department at the address of an elderly person for a wellness check. Generally, we didn't accompany the police on wellness checks, but since the citizen involved was diabetic and had a heart condition, we had been asked to tag along. Those of you reading this that are unaware of what a wellness check is, the police receive a call from a family member or neighbor requesting the police to check on someone to ascertain their situation. Basically, they ask the cops to make sure their loved one is doing okay, living or not a danger to themselves, that kind of stuff. Anyway, we met the two officers outside the subject's apartment, who in this case was a 77-year-old widow who lived alone with an army of cats. As we stood outside the door waiting for someone to open it, the faint smell of a decomp hung strong in the air of the cramped hallway. If the fact she didn't answer the door after five solid minutes of knocking wasn't a bad enough sign, the smell of a decomposing body confirmed our darkest suspicions. Once the handyman returned with a key and let us in the apartment, the officers entered to secure the scene and determine the status of the subject of the check. In a matter of seconds, the younger of the two officers stormed back out into the hallway, retching uncontrollably. Donald and I shared a look of bewilderment. It had been quite a long time since I remember seeing a cop getting sick at a scene. I figured it had to be very bad in there, and I wasn't wrong. The second officer came out a few seconds later holding a handkerchief over his face and gave us the okay wave with his head. One step into the door, I was hit with the overbearing stench of cat pee, the universal perfume of the crazy cat lady. The smell came close to overpowering the decomp and the combination of the two even made me a bit queasy. Donald went ahead of me while I put my bag down to dig out my flashlight. At that time, a cat zipped between my legs, not the door. I could only shake my head and hope I never ended up like this poor woman. <laughs>
I noticed Donald standing ahead of me looking down at something with a horrified look on his face. A couch blocked whatever it was, but I could only assume it was the body of the woman. His look did surprise me considering we had both seen more than our share of corpses, and some of those had been beyond gnarly. I heard him mumble the words, Dude, nasty, under his breath, and that only managed to make me more curious. He just looked up at me and said, Dude, this you gotta see, and turned around and walked out of the room. He was shook in a way I'd never seen him. I wasn't sure I wanted to see it, but that was my job, so with a knot in my stomach, I walked down the hall and into the living area. When I walked past the couch, I slowly looked down and saw the most horrible sight I have ever seen, and hope will ever see again. I reluctantly pulled out my flashlight and shone it down on her so I could get a clearer look in the dark room. Her body had the deflated look and almost black color that corpses take once they reached advanced decomp, but that wasn't the bad part. From what I could tell, her face had been chewed up and eaten by what I can only guess were the cats. She must have been dead for at least two or three weeks, and I assume when the cats ran out of food, they turned to the next option, her dead body. While I was crouched over her, I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched. I stood up, stifling the taste of bile seeping into my mouth, and turned to look for what was causing it. As I scanned the dark room with my light, what seemed like hundreds of little red eyes peered back at me from dark corners and under furniture. A chill slowly passed through me and I ran from the room and back into the hall to call the coroner and animal control. Donald and I stood in the hallway with the two officers. We all shared a few shock looks, but nothing was said until the coroner showed up. We made sure to warn him and his assistant about the state of her face, but unless you saw it for yourself, no one could really understand how horrid it looked. The two of them came out of the apartment a few moments later, rolling her body on a gurney and Thank God it was in a bag. I just wasn't ready to see that again. All I can say is I hope that poor lady was dead when those furry little monsters attacked her. Donald and I followed the coroner to his van and once her body was loaded, I asked him point blank what he had thought had happened. He looked me in the face almost nonchalantly. Far as I can tell, she had a cardiac event and was probably fed on by those cats. Her body's been in that apartment for at least a month, maybe longer considering it's winter and the heat wasn't on. The poor little things got hungry and she was the only thing left to eat. The last thing I saw those horrid creatures as were poor little things. He continued by saying this was not his first time to come across something like this and added there had been a big story in the UK when something very similar had happened just recently. We pulled away from the scene about the time animal control showed up. I certainly did not envy those guys. From what I heard later, they spent the rest of the night in that cramped little place and ended up coming out of there with 22 full-grown cats and a litter of kittens. I never found out if any of those little monsters were ever adopted, but I know for sure I'll never let my kids bring one home, no matter how much they beg me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merchandise on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.